Welcome everybody. Thank you for logging on. This is our evangelism workshop for diocesan convention this year. I'm really happy to be with you all. My name is Jason Evans and I'm the canon for mission here in the Diocese of San Diego. And we're going to go ahead and begin with a prayer uh, that we have available to us in our prayer book. This is one of our prayers for mission. So I invite you to be reminded that wherever you are, God is with you. And let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to reconcile the world to yourself. We praise and bless you for those whom you have sent in the power of the spirit to preach the gospel to all nations. We thank you that in all parts of the earth, the community of love has been gathered together by their prayers and labors, and that in every place your servants call upon your name for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. God's people said, amen. Well, friends, today we are talking about evangelism. And I know that evangelism can oftentimes be a bit of a sticky word for, for some of us. So I'd like to begin with a brief exercise. And to do this, I am going to need a couple of volunteers that would like to uh, be a part of this exercise. So it'll mean that you'll have to unmute yourself when I, I call upon you. Is, is there anybody that would like to volunteer? All right, my first volunteer is Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. I'll be happy to, Sydney at Trinity. All right, and Sydney at Trinity, awesome. Thank you, both of you for, for volunteering. Okay, so I'm gonna share with everybody uh, my screen for this brief exercise here just quickly so you guys can see what, our, what this is going to be. I would like you all, the two of you, to have a brief conversation about the best meal you've recently had. What's the best meal you've recently had? So one of you gets to share uh, a, a, about a, 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 an incredible meal. Feel free to share as much de detail as you would like about this with the other. The other person gets to listen and they can ask questions for details. So who would like to go first in this exercise? Hannah, thank you for going first. I appreciate it. So, so Sydney's going to listen to you share about an amazing meal, and the rest of us are going to listen in on this, on this uh, conversation. You're only going to have a brief amount of time before we move to the next phase of this exercise. So we'll give it about, ooh, let's say, maybe five minutes. Okay, Hannah? Okay. So you want me to talk for five minutes about my meal? <laughs> yes. Best um... meal you've had recently. I went to the water grill with Demetrius from St. Bart's just this week. And that's in downtown San Diego. And they had this amazing, like encrusted sea bass. And sea bass is one of my favorite kinds of fish. And it was, you know, really flaky and light on the inside. And then it had just this light crusting on the outside, like they had cooked it just perfectly to perfection and it was um, a bed of creamy like mashed potatoes and that was it it was very simple and then on the side I had ordered um their Brussels sprouts and it came with these like chunks of you know the thick bacon not the like little bacon bits but like really thick good bacon <laughs> and it was almost kind of caramelized bacon you know and it was so good oh now I'm uh, hungry <laughs> What did they, what did they, what was the crusting on top of the, the bass? Did they do anything in particular or was it just seared in such a way that? Yeah, good question. I think it was just, I mean, they must have had some kind of like a, definitely like butter and maybe some salt, but it was very simple. You know, like, I don't think there was any flour or anything. It was just cooked to perfection. So they, they allowed the, the flavor of the bass to come right through. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. It was so yeah. good. And then they, they paired it with a um, a wine that was one I had never had before. It wasn't Chardonnay. It was like, it started with an A. It was like Alba Baringo or something, like some wine that I'd never had before, but it was so good. It was like minerally, but not too minerally, but like paired with the fish, it was just delicious. A real subtle wine then. Yeah, I would say subtle, but um, 
Then I had a glass of red wine after that, and that had some punch. So that was all I could handle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's this place? Is the Water Grill? El Barino. Yeah, it was, it's called the Water Grill, and it's right on, I think it's on J Street in downtown San Diego. Yeah, so what was the atmosphere like in the restaurant? Really I mean, that had cool. to help to the mill. Absolutely, you're right. Good question. It was um, like you walk in and it's kind of like dark, heavy wood and like some cool old lanterns and um, candles on the table. You know, it was it was fine dining for sure. I mean, for me, it was. And they I didn't have an old fashioned, but the Kathy and Demetrius both had like two old fashions and they said they were really good. So, uh, you know, the, the servers wore like cute aprons. So it kind of felt like um, not like steampunk, but um, oh, like hipster, like hi upscale hipster atmosphere, I would that say. That sounds yummy. I don't think I want to go. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. great. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to make you both have to stop right there but let's all you know give some finger snaps give some uh, some uh some waves and thank you to to Hannah and Sydney for their uh their little experimental conversation here. I'm wondering some of you have been have already started to list things in the chat like great now we're all hungry etc. Uh let's let's reflect a little bit on this exper experience as as Hannah is now uh, so hungry, she's got to eat in the middle of the workshop. But, but let's talk a little bit about this experience. Um, Sydney, what was it like listening to Hannah talk about this great meal for you? I, it was a, an interesting experience in that she was very vivid in her description of the meal. I could see uh -huh. the bass sitting on top of the potatoes and just looking like really scrumptious there i could almost taste it she did a really good job of describing how it was and then when she described yes. the atmosphere it just brought me right into the restaurant it's like that's a place i could go and really yeah. enjoy a meal just anything that they served would probably just be overwhelming right. in the emulsion of flavors that they do yeah sounds like and and i am I'm, I'm gonna invite everybody else chime in in the chat about what uh, you thought, uh, what your reflections were, what stood out to you. We already know that, you, that you're making, we're making you hungry from this exercise. Obviously, someone put made sure to put in the chat the name of the restaurant. So people are, are probably putting this into their phone and trying to figure out where this restaurant might be so they can go check it out. Someone shared in the chat, she was very passionate even using hand movements. You were laughing, it was exuberant. Hannah, how did it feel to have somebody interested in your most uh, uh your, your most recent great meal how did it feel to have somebody listen to you share that it felt really great it felt nice to be asked about it and to be asked like reflective questions that showed she was listening and um yeah. i was really happy to share like the more she asked the more i remembered and wanted to share so the more curiosity she demonstrated the easier it was for you to recall things and remember different aspects of it and to share it even more yeah, and it wasn't like she asked questions like from a list. She asked questions like that showed that she had been listening to what I had just said, you know? So that was mm. nice too. Nice. Okay, so we're going to switch tracks a little bit on you guys. And we're going to flip the script here a little bit. We're going to flip roles. And I'm going to ask Sydney to share and Hannah to you, you to listen. So you're going to unmute yourself again. And what I'd like you to share, Sydney, is your most meaningful recent spiritual experience, your most recent, most uh, vivid experience of the divine with Hannah. It's not real recent. It's actually a couple of years ago that was really pretty overpowering. I'm not a birth Episcopalian. So um, I went through confirmation at Trinity and Bishop Susan Jefferts was there for my confirmation and when I knelt in front of her and she anointed me with the oil and the cross and put her hands on me the amount of warmth that came down through my whole body it just was peaceful and exhilarating at the same time I literally felt God enter into me saying you are where I want you to be my daughter this is where I've been pushing you for years you finally listened to me and I felt warm and welcomed 
and totally, completely embraced by God at that moment. The only other time I ever felt that was when I was baptized at 11, and I made my commitment to God. Wow. That's incredible, Sydney. I got goosebumps when you talked about that. <laughs> Being embraced by God. Did you feel just such a sense? Of I felt like it was only he and I right there, that he was wow. literally right there with me. Um, mm. I knew in my head that there were other people around me, and S Bishop Susan was so soft in her speaking and the way she touched me. I just felt right through her came God, and it was chilling but exciting and I felt so loved in that moment it was just wow. amazing <laughs> and the only other time you felt like that is at your baptism when I came up out of my baptism I was fully immersed in baptism and oh. I had been studying for six months about what that meant and when I came mm -hmm. up I felt warm and loved and that God was right there with me and my mom told me you glowed when you came out of the water. Oh, wow. And I didn't that's realize cool. that, but that's how I was feeling. And mm -hmm. that I knew right then this is where God wants me. Right now, right here, doing this thing. And oh. when confirmation hit, it was like, this is where I want you. This is where I've been leading you to be so that you can move forward to where I'm sending you. That's incredible. And, and oh, sorry, did you want to say something else? No, go ahead. I'm just going to ask, do you find in your life when you come to like the dark, hard, difficult places that if you think of that moment of confirmation or baptism, that it brings you some of that peace? It, it brings me back to a valley I was in. Mm -hmm. And this is not a bad place. Um, numerous years ago, I was very ill. I was in a coma. And mm -hmm. I was in heaven with my parents in this meadow. While I was in this coma, my body was healing, but God took me there to comfort me. And it was, it was peaceful and quiet, but there wasn't this overwhelming feel. There was a feeling of safety. And it wasn't this warmth embrace that I felt at baptism or confirmation, because that's when I was getting his approval for what I was doing. It was like, I'm here, your parents are here, they're gonna comfort you. And the only thing I actually remember hearing in that is, it's not your time. Mm. So I knew I was going to be sent back. Not that I wanted to leave because it was beautiful mm -hmm. and peaceful and loving. And it took away my fear. It took away the agony people see around death and began my journey. When I, that's when I started listening that God wants me to work in hospice and with the ill and with the dying. Wow. And I'm going to ask Sydney, I'm going to ask you to pause right there. Thank you. Uh, this, this obviously is a conversation that you guys could just keep going and yeah. going and going on. So thank you, yeah. both of you, for, for sharing. I want to stop right there. And again, let's give our friends uh, an applause. Thank you for sharing and being vulnerable in front of a whole group like you just were. But I want to ask everybody to, again, uh, list out in the chat for us. What was that like for you? What what it stood out to you? Um, I, I, there's a few things that stand out to me right away. It's it was definitely a more subdued conversation. It was a little. It was it was you re, you were recognizing the reverence of the moment, right? Uh, there was there was there were. This isn't just about a meal. It's but it, it certainly wasn't as lively and and uh, fun necessarily. Uh, it was still enjoyable. Um, but it was definitely, it definitely felt like it was getting a little bit more intimate there from my vantage uh, point. Um, I know you just took a bite, uh, Hannah, but I'd, I'd love to hear from the two of you what that experience was like. Uh, were you surprised when I asked you to talk with each other about this? Sydney, Hannah, I either of you? I, I wasn't surprised. I kind of anticipated you were going to ask something similar something to that. Like yeah. yeah, or, yeah. you know, my conversion story or something to that effect. But this is, I, I really don't talk about those feelings with many people. Um, yeah, yeah. Because they are very personal. They are very personal. And that's actually something I want to, uh, to, to point out is that the reason why we're having this conversation in many ways is because the subject of evangelism, the idea of talking about our spiritual stories is something that is oftentimes 
a little awkward for us. It's something that we feel is a little uncomfortable. In fact, one Lilly endowment funded research project studying mainline denominations found that both clergy and laity responded to the idea of doing evangelism as painful. Uh, uh, words such as pushy, embarrassing, uncomfortable, awkward, pressuring, uh, these and other words such as this were the words that were used to describe evangelism. And yet evangelism starts with you, friends. Evangelism begins first and foremost with you. And it starts with how you have experienced God at work in your own life. And it is through us under, having a deeper understanding of how God has been at work in our own lives that we are able to notice God at work in the, the world around us. And there is actually a, a quote from Madeline Lengel that I think is helpful for us in this, uh, in this conversation. She wrote, we draw people to Christ, not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. And this is, I think, something that I, would, I, I believe would be helpful for us as we continue our conversation this evening to think about evangelism in this way, that it is yeah. something that is contagious, that it is something that as we reflect on our own lives and, and are it, able to see God at work in our own lives, we're able to share that with, uh, with others. So this is not a, a new practice is something to point out here. This isn't something that is, uh, is exclusive to particular traditions. Throughout the church historic, there have been exercises, practices, habits that have helped us be more attuned to what God is doing in our own lives so that we can recognize where God is at work in the lives of others. And one of those was developed by St. Ignatius, this, uh, this practice called the examine. Let me just see a show of hands. Who's heard of the examine? Can you put your hands up there so I can see it? Got a few hands up there. Yeah. The examine is this ancient practice of paying attention to where God is at work in our own lives. And in by doing so, we are more capable of recognizing where God is at work in the world. So for those of us that are not familiar with the examine, let's just do a, a miniature examine practice for a moment. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to just uh, take a moment to reflect on the day, to look back at where our day took us until we got to this point of of coming online to be a part of convention this year and ask ourselves the question of where God was at work throughout our day. So if you would just get, get comfortable kind of wherever you are sitting right now, maybe make just uh, relax your shoulders, take a deep breath, close your eyes if you feel more comfortable, And we're going to take a moment. We're just going to look back at our entire day and ask ourselves, where was God? Where was God? So let's look at the beginning of your day. You're getting up this morning. You're getting ready to go about whatever it is you're doing for the first part of your day. Where do you notice God? And as you move throughout your morning, is, is it a quick breakfast? Is there any breakfast involved? Are you rushed? Is it slow? Where is God? Now, as you move into the middle of your day, who are you meeting with? Who do you see? What are you doing? Where do you notice God? And as you move into the afternoon, 
Where do you find yourself? Who are you engaging with? Do you notice God? Take a moment to just breathe that in and be reminded of where God was at work in your life. If you like, maybe make note of it. Take a moment to thank God for God's work and presence in your life today. Maybe ask God for a deeper awareness of God's presence tomorrow. Breathe in, breathe out, amen. See, this is just something that the Christians throughout the history of the church have done to notice where God is at work in our own lives. And it's in noticing where God is at work in our own lives that we, like I said, are more capable of noticing where God may be at work in the world around us. I'm curious, what was that experience like for you? I see one hand is up. Susan Latimer, do you want to unmute and, and share? Um, I didn't mean to leave my hand up, but yeah, I'll be glad to. So um, hold on, let me just go outside. <laughs> so I am, um, Friday's my, normally my day off. So I'm down here um, visiting with my mother and our um, younger son who lives with her now. My mom is 95 and Hugh is um, 23. And so we were able to... Um, play some games together this morning and laughed. We laughed really, really, really a lot. And so I, I um, experienced God in our laughter that we had this morning when we were playing Scrabble. Love it. We've got a few comments uh, in, in, that people are putting in here. God is with me palpably when I give myself or other grace give myself or others grace thank you for that mary brown and uh, for for your reflections susan so one of the things that's important to remember is that uh when we think about evangelism we often think about what as in relation to what we are saying or doing with others this aspect of evangelism we often talk about witness and maybe the first example of witness that we have in scripture uh, is Adam in the creation narrative, where we see God bringing before Adam all that God has created, and Adam is naming the, all the creatures. He looks at this crazy animal with a long neck and crazy tongue and says, wow, that's, that's a giraffe, and that's really good news that God created something as wild looking as that. But our task in, in the work of evangelism is not necessarily con crafting something or concocting something, but noticing the good news, the good work that God is already up to in the world around us. Uh, but the interesting thing at this point in time in our history or in, or in our experience as church is that we find ourselves in this post-pandemic or emerging from a post-pandemic uh, into a post-pandemic world. We find ourselves that are slowly emerging from this experience that we've grown accustomed to connecting in an online manner that is often more about a particular time rather than space. In other words, we're not necessarily coming together as Christians in a particular space, but we're connecting at a particular time. Um, simultaneously and almost ironically is that people are getting used to connecting with each other asynchronously. In other words, that uh, you know people participate in maybe your worship service of your church at different times. They're not necessarily coming together at the same time, but watching what's recorded at different times. But as, additionally, one of the things that we long for, that we're longing for in this time is human connection. More as the more time we spend distanced from each other, uh, the the more we are longing to be with each other. And at the same time, we're finding ourselves more accustomed to gathering in smaller groups, uh, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing in any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but uh, these are some of the realities we as church are facing. But one of the things that seems to be incredibly uh, 
poignant for this particular time and place is the fact that we are facing a, a time and a place where, where trust in the church has been declining and it has been declining for quite some time. Uh, you know, one of the things that has come out in recent studies is that because of public scandals of religious leaders of various traditions is that trust in religious leaders and the institutions that they, re they, that they represent has been on an, a continual decline. In fact, the general social survey that's been conducted from 1974 to 2018 has reflected this year after year that the, uh, the amount of people that say that they trust religious institutions and their leaders a great deal is decreasing. And those that say that they have hardly any trust in religious leaders and their institutions continues to decline. And yet we follow a savior who has called us to love our neighbor. In fact, in the gospels, we are told that, uh, that we, we, we read in several of the gospels that uh, when Jesus is asked what the greatest of the commands are for us, that Jesus says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our man, mind in the second is is like it, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, oftentimes, what our evangelistic tactics are trying to do is to get people to love us, and yet Jesus is calling us to love our neighbor, and we are doing so in this time and place where trust in religious institutions has been diminishing. So I have a simple question for you to reflect on with me here. Let's put this on a micro level. What happens for you if there's someone that you love and you've lost trust with them? What is required of you in that situation? What do you have to do to regain the trust of someone that you love? Let's see if you have something you'd like to share. Why don't you raise your hands? Yeah, Hannah. Well, you have to talk to them and you have to have a brave conversation where you're honest, but also kind and you share your experience. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you do need to do most of the talking in that conversation or? No, probably you should do most of the listening. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So listening is important if we're attempting to gain the trust of those that we are called to love. Absolutely. What else do we what else do we need to do, friends? I think part of it too is admitting that we were wrong, like admitting kind of like the confession part of the church saying like people have lost trust in the institution because the institution has hurt people, you know, like it was oh, there's a reason that people have lost trust. Yeah, so, so like yeah, that's great. That. Yeah, that's great, Marilyn. Exactly. We have to be willing to be uh, be honest about how we've screwed up. And let's be honest, like it's it's not as if we we're seeing the Episcopal Church come up in the headlines of any of the scandals we're talking. You know, you might bring you might have come to mind in this moment, but nonetheless, people outside the church may not make that connection that oh, there's something different about the Episcopal Church. And so recognizing that, yeah, we represent something that might not be perceived as trustful at times. So we have to be willing to confess and listen. What else? What else do we need to do when we're, I saw, I saw one hand go up. I'm sorry, friends, I'm trying to there's a, this is a big group. Oh, Jim. Jason, just to let you know, Daniel keeps raising his hand and you missed him. <laughs> I'm sorry, Daniel. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Ed. I, Daniel, I, go ahead and then Jim. Yeah, I think that um, when you're upset at somebody, I think that it's important to talk to somebody else uh, who has insight into your own personality before you talk to that person, um, I found that I just drawing on this an experience that I just had that I had this conversation with somebody I really trusted with before I talked to somebody that I was upset with, and this helped me incredibly. And we just it was so much help to me, and I felt God's presence in this person as I've done felt in the past. And then when I approached the person that I was upset with. It was completely a different attitude, a different emotion that was 
driving me. And so I was very fortunate to be able to have somebody I trusted with before I went to the person that I was upset with. Thank you, Daniel. That's a really good observation. And I think that how that correlates to this idea of we as the church and how we actually love our neighbors and seek to earn trust of our neighbors is how important our partners and those that we collaborate with in our communities are. That oftentimes when we, many of our congregations are involved in various different ministries where we work with other um, nonprofit organizations or different faith traditions or different denominations. And sometimes uh, that those partners are the ones that, that uh, are vet us for, for those that may be a little uh, distrustful of the church. And so that recognizing that our partnerships with, the, with others in our community of having relationships outside of the church with other entities is a really important piece of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Daniel. Jim, Jim Duke. I think it's important when we have those conversations that we make it clear that we love the person. It's the behavior that has caused the lack of trust. It doesn't affect the unconditional love that we have for the people, that it's the behavior that is, uh, is, is the subject of it. And so I think it's important I, I, as a teacher, I often had students misbehave in class. I still love them as students, but I didn't particularly like the behavior. And when I had a conversation with them, I said, the kids would say, you don't like me? I said, I love you, you're a great student. It's the behavior that, and it always was a good successful conversation, so. Thank you, Jim. Alan Dorsey, you have your hand up. Hey, Alan. Hi, Jason. Uh, yeah, just a, a quick story because it brought to mind, your question brought to mind a, a very close friend of mine who was very close during about the last 10 years. And then uh, about two years ago came to me and, and said that he could no longer talk to me because our differences, our political differences were so different and that um, he unloaded on, on me a bit of why he didn't want any further relationship. and. Uh, I tried several times to to um, to reapologize to to apologize and not just to apologize but to tell him I wanted to have a conversation. And after many, I believe, good faith efforts, um, he continued to say, "No, I don't want to have any conversation." And so that that was extremely upsetting to me. Um, yeah. I didn't want to grieve the loss of that friendship, but I was doing that. And I, I was led to believe that, wait a minute, um, you have done everything you can. Your time now is just to let it go and be okay with the situation because um, this wasn't for me to resolve right then. And one of these days, if it will get resolved, um, I will know and I will have the opportunity to reestablish the trust that we once enjoyed together. So learning to live Thank sometimes you. with discomfort. Yeah. yeah, living with the discomfort. That is really a good point, Alan. You know, there's, there's a, an author that has written on the subject of evangelism that I think offers us some helpful tips for thinking about this. Her name is Brenda Salter McNeil. And in her book, A Credible Witness, she actually talks about witness, thinking about it in the legal understanding of that term. And there's a few things that she mentions in that book. She says that uh, the, this legal understanding of giving witness requires that we are in the right place, that we're in the right place at the right time, that we're at the right place for the right duration of time, that we see the right things, and we're able to relay what we've seen with accuracy. And I think how this relates to what Alan just brought up is just to simply recognize that what we're talking about in many regards is presence, presence in our communities, presence with those people that sometimes um, may not trust us immediately and recognizing that sometimes it just takes time. We often talk about in church planting circles that mission moves at the speed of relationships. And evangelism does the same thing. The evangelism is not necessarily about some dramatic uh, 
life-changing experience all in one moment, although oftentimes it can be like that for folks. But it also, as, as uh, Barbara Brown Taylor often talks about, is the valleys in between those mountaintop experiences. And it requires presence. It requires that we spend time with those that we hope to have conversation with about the good news of Jesus, that we hope to regain trust. But it, it's, it also means that we recognize that it, it, it's going to take us time to regain trust, uh, that it, it won't happen overnight. It's going to be something that will we'll take time as we, as we go about the work of evangelism. I think there may have been one other hand that I missed. I want to make sure I catch everybody that wants to chime in here. It was Sydney, I believe. Oh, Sydney, did you have something you wanted to ask? Yeah. Um, everyone, what they said was really helpful, but I think the point of your question was, how do we get those who mistrust the church as a whole because of the bad actors? How do we gain their trust? It's not us mistrusting somebody else and having to have them regain trust in us, but rather how do we get the world to see us as not like those bad actors, those people who are out there mm -hmm. who are constantly in front of them. We have had a couple generations now where people have been sitting out in front. They're loud. They get all the media attention and they have set an incorrect example of what evangelism is. It has turned into a dirty word and people want to avoid it because they don't want to be affiliated with those people who are going to constantly ask for money, constantly tell me I'm wrong and this is what you're supposed to be doing and if you don't do it well, dot, 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 dot. And I think that's right. part of what we have to overcome is how do we get past that barrier and that and I think some of it is doing is how do we, for lack of a better word, eliminate those bad actors, or at least well, eliminate them that, from the media. Well, I don't know that that's our agenda. Uh, and that, that might be another agenda for another workshop. But the idea, and I'm not sure what the title of that workshop would be, to be quite honest. But, the, but, the, but, the, but on the subject of evangelism, I think that you're right, that there are people that in our, in our culture, um, Christianity doesn't hold the, the position it once did in our culture. Um, and those that do get the headlines oftentimes may represent what we say uh, we are as, as Episcopalians. And so, but this through this analogy, thinking about it in this light, there's a few things that I think that we've thought of, we, we've considered that are helpful for us as we think about how we do the work of evangelism. First, that presence is important. How do we engage uh, our neighborhoods and the communities are around our churches so that whether it be individuals and neighbors that live by or businesses or uh, partners in serving others, how do we do so in, a, in, in an ongoing way so that we can build trust with people? On an individual level, how do we go about the practice of listening to the cares and concerns of our, our neighbors around us so that we can understand uh, what, they, what they are concerned about, what their cares are, but also so that we can earn the trust to be heard uh, rather than going into a situation and assuming that we already have the right to be heard. And so there's a few things that I think that are helpful for us as we as we go about this work of presence and listening and humility as we go about uh, our work of evangelism. And the first thing, like I said, is that we, as we actually did the exercise at the beginning of this time together, is we, we, we spend time getting familiar with our own spiritual stories. Where has God been at work in our own lives? Has it been through the Eucharist service? Is it in serving others? Is it being served by others? Is it a moment in time where we were just in awe of creation or something of that nature? But how has God nourished your life in a way that you have you are increasingly aware of? And there's a variety of different things that we can do to, to cultivate that in our lives and in the, the folks that are in our congregations. But first and foremost, getting clear on our own story so that we can be attuned to the stories that are unfolding around us, where God is at work in our communities around us. But then having a plan by which we would be engaging the community around our parishes and missions, rather than waiting for folks to come to us. An activity that's as really simple for any congregation to take on is a prayer walk. 
simply organizing folks from the congregation to walk around the bounds of the parish or walk around the block or the community that a congregation worships within so that you can be seen, but also you can be paying attention to what God might be doing in the community. Another activity is just to simply do an exercise where you and leaders in your congregation begin to think about who you might be able to partner with right now in your congregation, in your community. Is there a group that's uh, serving in a particular way that really aligns with your congregation that you could partner with? Is there a story of a community leader or uh, just, or the community as a whole that is important for your congregation to know and hear that you could highlight in announcements or invite someone to come and share from the community in a forum to build familiarity with what's going on in the surrounding community. But building that connection with the surrounding community that you worship within, building that a sense of presence within that community so that you are seen and you see people in the community. And hopefully that leads to opportunities where you can actually have conversations with others. The other thing is something that uh, I think is quite frankly, it, isn't, it doesn't necessarily equate itself exactly to evangelism, but necessarily could lead to evangelistic conversations. And that's invitation, simply inviting people to come and join you for worship. Now that in and of itself, like I said, is not necessarily evangelism, but it provides the opportunity to have conversations with, uh, with your friends, your colleagues, your family members that join you in worship. Who here, just by a show of hands, has ever used Yelp? Yelp.com. Okay, I'm seeing a few hands go up. Who's, who's used Amazon reviews to ever make a purchase of some kind? Looked through the review. Okay, I see a few hands. Who's looked at Google ratings for places? Uh, I'm seeing even more hands. So we live in a world where we're constantly willing to, to look to our peers, or those around us, and, cons and, and consider, consider something based upon their own recommendation and, and understanding how they have perceived of whatever it be from the kind of dog food you buy to a restaurant you might visit. What if we apply that same kind of uh, rule to, to church where we actually were curious about how our neighbors and those that live and play and work around our worshiping place, our places we worship and considered how, how they experienced our worshiping community. Think about simply inviting someone to church with you and then taking them out to brunch or a cup of coffee or just sitting on your, your patio and asking them, what was church like for you? What questions did you have? What, what things stood out to you? What excited you? Not only does this give us an opportunity to talk to our friends and neighbors and family members and coworkers about God and, and things of, 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 of the church, but it also gives us a, an understanding, a better understanding of how people in our community experience our church. And those things that maybe are a little mysterious and unknown to the folks around us that maybe they're confused by and unfamiliar with. Um, we, we are steeped in tradition in, our, in the Episcopal Church, but that means that there's a lot of folks that are probably really unfamiliar with why we do certain things. And so providing ourselves the opportunity to have those kinds of conversations with folks and help them understand what we think God is up to when we gather and worship is another way that we can begin to share God's good news with our neighbors. We are actually coming up on our time that we have today. So there's a few things I want to quickly do before we end together. And that is, I wanna make sure that I mention with you, you I mentioned to you uh, a few resources. As I mentioned, one thing that you can do is begin to think about invitation, the practice of invitation. And the Diocese of Toronto has come up with a resource called Invited that is a really non-anxious uh, way to begin to have the conversation about inviting folks from our communities to come and worship with us. So this is a resource I would recommend that you folks from your parish might want to look at. The next thing to consider is the book Unbinding the Gospel by Martha Grace Reese. 
there was a group that just went through reading this book together, studying its uh, and its how it and how it approaches this idea of evangelism uh, from a mainline uh, tradition perspective. And uh, some of those folks are actually becoming um, licensed evangelists, licensed lay evangelists here soon. And that's pretty exciting. But this book is a great resource for any congregation that wants to have begin to have conversations about how evangelism might be more centered in your, your congregational life and some tips on how to actually, um, how to actually get that started in your congregation. The last thing I will say is this is something that is really important to us here at the diocese. And so if you ever have questions or you want to uh, talk more about some of these resources um, and how evangelism might become a part of what you are doing in your parish, this is my email address, address jevans at edsd.org. And I encourage anybody and everybody to reach out. Let me know how I can be helpful to you and what you are doing in your parish as it relates to evangelism, help you out with resources, maybe connect to parishes nearby that are thinking about evangelism and working on it in their uh, context. So a couple of resources for you, some contact information. We have a few minutes left before we need to break for the remainder of our programming for this evening. So let me just pause there and uh, see if there's any other questions. I do think there was a hand that just went up. Seeing it though. Claire Friedman. Claire Friedman. Okay. Hi, Claire. Yes, am I on mute? No, we can hear you. Good. I, I just wanted to mention something that I don't think you had mentioned at all, but it's easy enough, at least at our church, where we have concerts, to invite somebody who never goes into the church to be churchy, but loves music, and brings that brings them into the church, and, and they come in and they say, what a beautiful church, and, and it makes them much more open to the idea that Church is a way you can be moved spiritually and emotionally because that's how the way they feel music. And, and so to me, and we do have choir concerts at our church, that one of the ways that we can get people in and some of them stay forever is through music. And thank you. I appreciate that comment. And it is, like I said, is you know, the, the practice of invitation is a part of the work of evangelism. And so, yes, absolutely. Inviting folks uh, to come and participate in something in the church, begin to be familiar with the space and the people that are there is absolutely one of the things that we can, you know, tools we can utilize. Let's remember, though, that this idea of evangelism, of recognizing where God has been at work in our own lives and where God may be is at work in the world around us and the lives of others, uh, that announcement and giving witness to, to that work uh, doesn't always doesn't require that people come to the church, but certainly that, that engagement around the church, in the church, provides us opportunities to talk about that with the folks in our, in our lives. There was one other hand that I just saw go up. Mary. Hi, Mary. Yes. Hi. Um, about a year and a half ago, quite a few of us at our church began to take part in all of the studying about social injustice and climate change and so forth. And after about a year and a half of this, I asked the question, well, what are we going to do with all of this information that we have? And we had some young people in their uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s that were participating. And it seemed that they, their friends were, were staying away from the church because the church was not offering help in the challenging life that they face today. So we created what we call community conversations that we held in September and October. And we dealt with environmental issues that affected us personally, the upcoming composting, the planting of native gardens, the estuaries, the rising sea levels. And through these programs online, we reached over 640 people. The attendance in the actual church was far less, but yet we had reached out into the community to the point where we are going to go ahead and continue this in January and February, handling subjects that our community is interested in. 
Thank you, Mary. And what Mary is demonstrating for us is exactly what we're talking about right now on a macro level, this idea that we would pay attention to where God is at work in the, in, or what, what God is doing in the world around us. The church aligns with what they believe God is up to in the world. And uh, having heard the concerns about the people in the community, trying their best to figure out how to respond to, uh, to, to those, those issues. I think that is also a great example of how we can do that even on a personal level. How can we have those kinds of conversations with those that live nearby us or work with us or we go to yoga with or whatever it may be? How can we pay attention to the current concerns and hopes for, for them in their individual lives and try to be aware of where God is at work in their lives as well? So Mary, uh, you're, you're quite popular in the chat and people would love to know which parish you're a member of. It says All Souls. <laughs> okay, All Souls, thank you. No, Appreciate wait, that, that. that's Mary Brown. That's oh. a little different, that's me. Uh, another Mary, Mary, Porter. Mary Porter, I'm not sure. I'd love to know where Mary goes. Uh, St. Dunstan's. Thank you, Mary. Any other, any, any other questions or comments? I wanna make sure I didn't miss anybody. I could just add, Jason, uh, that yes. um, as, as you know, but I'll let everybody else know, we are rebooting the year of evangelism to 2022. Um, since uh, 20 You're stealing my closing comments. <laughs> yes. All right. Never mind. I won't say it. But no. Go ahead. Please. Please <laughs> let them let them hear from you. Uh, well, uh, because 2021 did not prove to be the most fruitful year for evangelism, since uh, many of us were stuck in our homes for a good part of that time, uh, we are rebooting the year to 2022, and our presiding bishop will be with us in December of 2022. And Jason uh, has a number of things that he uh, and others will be offering next year. Year, which um, I, I won't steal his thunder on because I'm sure he's about to talk about that. Um, but I but just to point out that um, our next uh, event is at 5:15. Um, my keynote conversation with the presiding bishop, and that is on a different Zoom link, which I put in the chat. But Jason, please take it away. <laughs> problem. Uh, we do want to make sure that we give you time to have a bit of a break before we go into our next session, but I do want to just make sure that we close with this reminder that the work of evangelism begins first with you. It, it begins with you recognizing where God has been at work in your own life so that you can be more attuned and more aware of where God is at work in the world around you. We can do that on an individual level and we can do that collectively as congregations. So that is where evangelism begins uh, for each of us so that we can give witness to what God is up to in our own lives and the world around us. Uh, as uh, the bishop mentioned, for the year of evangelism, there are several things that we're going to be doing throughout the year to try to provide you tools and resources for the work of evangelism. I mentioned two resources just a moment ago and shared uh, you a screenshot of, of a couple of those. The, the invited series that was developed by the Diocese of Toronto is something that we're going to be inviting congregations to, to uh, be trained in using so that we can talk about the, the work of inviting people to participate in our communities in ways that are not anxious and uh, we feel more comfortable with the work of inviting folks to come and participate in our congregations. And I also shared with you the book, Unbinding the Gospel. We're going to be using that throughout the year as well to train people in the work of evangelism. Now, that particular book itself really talks about how we shape uh, our community, our congregational culture around the work of evangelism. And so while that piece is important, we'll also be adding into looking at the materials from Martha Grace Reese's book, um, the work of actually learning how to tell our stories better. How can we actually uh, share our good news stories of, of where God has been at work in our lives? Uh, and lastly, I'll just simply say that we're really committed to making tools available for folks of all ages. And so we're going to be partnering with our formation team, Charlotte Pressler, and, and hoping to make sure that uh, we have resources for all of our folks uh, to think about how evangelism becomes a part of our shared life together. Um, the, uh, we'll be talking about this again tomorrow, but I'll quickly just remind for those of you that haven't yet um, been a part of this conversation, but next year, 
uh, the visitations, the bishop's visitations will be a little bit different because we're inviting each congregation to use its primary service as a kind of mini revival where we rekindle our spirits. And boy, have we had a, a year or so that is just, we, we really need, we need re, uh, uh, to rekindle our spirits. And so our hope is that, is that we can use those primary services for the bishop's visitations and as an opportunity for folks to invite new folks into our congregations, for folks to share their stories of where God has been at work in their lives and in their communities and celebrate what God is up to in our midst. So uh, you'll be seeing more of that coming out as we come to the close of this calendar year and beginning the next year. So um, more to come on that. But thank you for caring about the subject of evangelism enough to show up to this conversation. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email again is jevans, J-E-V-A-N-S at edsd.org. And I am so grateful to be a part of this diocese and a partner with each of you in this gospel work. Peace, friends.